wondered about the role that design can play in the practice of policy making. This brief lecture will give you a quick overview of this topic, highlighting its main strength and the potential for further development. We will cover three main topics. First, we will look at the specific type of public problems that design can be most useful for. Second, we will look at the main areas where design can support policymaking. Finally, we will sum up the elements discussed and share a few considerations and hopes for the future. It's a matter of fact that policymaking is a practice in constant evolution. Every day we hear about this in the news. What are the deeper motivations behind this ongoing transformation? Let's think about a concrete example. Regulations to contain the damage resulting from natural events like floods, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. First, a simple framework can help us understand these events in terms of governance. We will plot on the vertical axis the complexity of an event related to the number, variety and typology of stakeholders involved and on the horizontal axis, the degree of predictability of the variables involved in the problem at hand. An event that is likely to be predicted will be placed in the bottom left corner of the grid, while an unpredictable event will be plotted in the top right corner. Making an extreme simplification, it is possible to predict flooding using modern technology. For example, knowing which areas can be potentially affected and the main causes that might trigger this phenomena. Floods can be placed in the lower left corner of the diagram. To predict a volcanic eruption and the areas potentially affected is virtually impossible. It is impossible to know when and if an eruption will occur. This is why volcanoes can be placed in the upper right corner, just outside our diagram. The complete inability to predict eruptions result in a non-measurable, extensive complexity that places them out of this matrix. Earthquakes are very difficult to predict in terms of their intensity, duration or timing. Yet, much can be done to monitor seismic activity and prevent potential damage. For example, the Italian government has developed specific measures to cover up to 85% of the costs for making buildings more resistant to earthquakes. Yet, not even 50% of the areas at risk in Italy have undergone seismic retrofitting. Earthquakes can be placed in the upper right corner of the diagram for this reason. This example leads us to ask, what is the reason for the gap between government measures and the results achieved through their uptake by the population? And what should be the right way to regulate earthquakes? These are complex public problems where acting only on one part of the system, like giving you incentives, is not enough. And we need to look at the entire system simultaneously. Having illustrated the type of public problem design deals with, let's now move to the second topic of this lecture the main areas where design can support policymaking. Three main areas can be identified. The object delivered by the policy, typically represented by public services, such as an alert service warning citizens about an incoming natural disaster. In our case, repeated earthquake tremors could trigger such an alert. The subject that creates and implements policy. Here we talk about people, but also about organizations. Going back to our example, regulating earthquakes can involve more than policymakers. Scientists and experts, citizens and third parties can contribute to understanding and responding to the issue at stake. Design can help policymakers, politicians and civil servants to co-create with all of the parties involved in order to provide alternative, better ways for addressing public challenges. Third, the process used to devise and implement policies. In the case of the alert service, policies about such earthquake-related services can be developed following a top-down or a bottom-up approach, deriving from governmental priorities in the case of the former or citizens' needs in the case of the latter. We will now look at each one of these areas in more detail. Regarding the object of policy, design is a long tradition 
dating back to the 60s and 70s, of helping governments make public services more inclusive and participative. Approaches such as participatory design and co-design have supported the democratic participation of diverse societal groups. Another important point of view in the development of public services is the one proposed by service design to link public service offerings with people's needs and culture. This approach is important when seeking to introduce citizen centricity in the development of public services. In other words, when trying to put people's needs first. The second way in which design is supporting policymaking is by enhancing the capacities of the subjects that create and implement policy. Design-based skills are introduced in the repertoire of skills of public servants and policymakers. Design can propose a wide range of tools and methods to respond to the need to look at challenges differently. Customer journeys, storyboards, prototypes, different types of visualizations, all with the aspiration to make policies more tangible for the people. Finally, the third area in which design can offer support is the process of policymaking. By process, we mean the ways in which political decisions are translated into regulations, ready for the people to adopt them. Design can contribute to creating a complex space where several conditions meet. Understanding people's real needs, creating a regulation that works for them, and communicating how the regulation addresses their needs in a way that everyone can understand. If we want to embed design in policymaking, we need to discuss not only what design can do for government, but also what creates the legitimacy of government. In other words, we need to look into what makes governments accountable for their choices and how we can open these up for everybody to participate. Design is helping to introduce a new set of practices and tools, but its contribution is limited. There is a wider conversation we need to have about the culture of public decision-making and the types of public institutions we want in our society. To conclude, we are currently embarked on a long-term challenge, reflecting on how design and co-creation can enable better interaction, accountability and legitimacy, and hopefully lead people to regain trust in the res publica.